Pleasure to welcome Girish Karnad, distinguished playwright, writer, actor, director, and public intellectual. He's published his autobiography last year. He's also, I believe, writing a book of essays on the less known aspects of well-known people. Um, he's also in the center for discussion on Naipaul's understanding of Islam, or lack thereof. Uh, his talk today is titled Culture and Entertainment, which he just told me is part of a book he's publishing soon. So with that, I invite Dr. Karna. I was invited to speak here. I really didn't expect such a large gathering. I'm, you know, trying to catch my breath. This is a, a great honor to be here, and I'm, I'm grateful to you for inviting me here today. The other problem is that I've, for the last two days, I've been suffering from a bad cold and cough. So if I lose track of my argument, I shall burst into cough, into a cough. And <laughs> you must then take it as an indication that I don't know what to say next. Um, so well, I, when I was asked to speak on this subject today, I didn't know what subject to take up. Uh, and I said art and culture, culture and entertainment. I don't know. They're all interchangeable, really. Um, simply because it was a kind of dichotomy that I used to suffer from professionally in the 60s when I was in the films. You know, the films were divided into entertainment films, the commercial films on one side, and art films on the other. And, you know, there was this big discussion as to what's an art film and what's an entertainment film and so on. After that, many years later, I came across a definition by Marshall McLuhan, you know, the Canadian um, uh, intellectual, who gives a very, a very sharp def uh, uh, definition of the connection between an art form and an entertainment form, which I think we can take as the basis of our discussion today. Marshall McLuhan says, an art form is only an entertainment form which has lost its audience. You know, I mean, theater was an entertainment form once. I mean, it's, people used to flock to it, and people used to sneer at it. Then it lost its audience, films came, and theater became art. Then similarly, films have lost its audience now. It's become art. Now television, uh, hopefully, will soon become art. So, and, and you know, so, so uh, talking of art and ent entertainment, so on. So in effect, what I shall try to do is to cover uh, 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 a whole perspective of the various entertainment forms and art forms that we have, we have seen around us and through which I have been through to some extent. And the question then arises as to where do you start? Because you know, everything in India starts 2,000 years ago, as you know. Uh, and with art and culture, of course, you can even go back 5,000 years ago because you know you have Mahanjigaru and so on and so on. So you have to define a line and the temptation is to start with independence and say, a new India emerged with independence. But actually, when you think of it, you find that independence didn't really start a new India culturally or politically or in terms of thought. In fact, most of the thoughts were already there. Most of the currents were already there before independence, which crossed over. So it's a safer point of beginning to think about, to take is the coming of the colonial regime. You know, uh, The British who came in the 17th and the 18th century because they brought in new ideas and so on. And we had to start thinking, we as a nation, well, it's, it, we can't think of us as a nation in the 18th century, but we had to start thinking in terms of new categories. The British brought two particularly uh, important changes in our life. The first thing they did was they brought English as the manner of instruction. About this, a lot has been said, you know. Um, what they did, in effect, they, they, of course, didn't um, mean us to take to it creatively. They only wanted clerks, and they wanted us to learn English, um, you know, uh, to, to, so that their files could be moved. They, they were not that far-sighted as to imagine that I would today stand here and talk to you in English. But English has become our language, and it has meant, therefore, that we now not only communicate in terms of a foreign language, but we define our own lives in terms of that foreign language. In fact, the very categories we live, in our society, uh, which may be ours, but are nevertheless categories which are brought from outside. Uh, for instance, a thing like caste. 
you know, it's, the cast as defined in English is quite different from cast as it's lived by the people who, or class, for instance, which is a very English connotation because class is acceptable in English society, but is not a, a comprehensible or, um, immediately in Indian terms and so on. And any number of caste, class, uh, joint family, for instance, is another thing. Um, so what English did, I mean, I won't go on because you must have read a lot about it, is they actually brought in a new valorization, new valuation of the concepts in the life we live. I shall uh, hold forth on it or I shall explain that later. Uh, but uh, the coming of English, as I need hardly say, was, more was very important in our understanding of our own life. The second thing they did, which very few of us really don't uh, really realize, and among the Indian sociologists, the first one to bring attention to it was, in fact, Ashish Nandi, which was they created three colonial cities. They created Bombay, Calcutta, and Madras. You know, these colonial cities started off as factories. I mean, they started off as, uh, on, as ports from which they could trade with England and come back and trade with India. And then around them, because they gave protection to Indian traders, collected Indian traders, and they developed into cities. So um, we have these three colonial cities. Of course, India had its own cities, of course, you know, and before, and bigger cities, in fact. We had cities like Delhi, we had cities like Hyderabad, uh, Pune, for instance, Kolhapur even, which were Indian cities, but they were very different from the cities that the British created. And this is where what I want to talk about for a couple of minutes. You see, in Indian cities, there was a continuity of values between what was happening in the cities and what was happening in the villages. The people who lived in the cities shared the same va values as uh, their cousins in the villages, as, as to say, uh, what is caste, how to deal with elders, what, re what does religion mean, should you marry your cousin or not, you know, problems like that. And, and, and they shared and there was a continuity of values. Of course, the uh, people in the cities must have been a little more snobbish, they always are, than their cousins. But there was another kind of economic connection between the cities and the uh, hinterland, which is that most of the craftsmen lived outside. You know, if you had to build a house in a traditional Indian city, you have to send for the mason, the carpenter, everyone. And there, there were various villages where they lived, and they came and they stayed for six months in the uh, town, uh, city, and they built your house or whatever it is, and they went. So there was a continuity of values, a continuity of system, a continuity of society between the traditional Indian city and its surroundings. What was special about the English cities was that they had their own set of values. Because the English came, this was the 18th, 19th century, this was the height of free trade, as you know. And they brought here the concept of free trade, they believed in free trade, they, uh, they, they, didn't, they uh, claimed uh, on the equality of individuals, they believed in competition, they didn't believe in caste and nepotism and so on, they believed in a new society, you know. There was a whole set of values which were at least fashionable, whether they were practiced or not by Indians, were fashionable in these cities, um, uh, uh, which set apart the Indian in the city from his uh, cousin in the uh, countryside, you know? Because these were not the values that, that the cousins believed in. The cousins believed in traditional values. And the British cities created a complete dichotomy, a complete disjuncture of values between what was happening in the cities and what was happening uh, in the villages. A completely new world came up. A, a beautiful example of this is a novel called Umrao Janada. Uh, um, you must have, um, I hope you have read it. It's a Urdu novel. Um, it's in the, it's uh, set in the 1860s. And um, it's supposed to be the autobiography of a courtesan of Lucknow. And it's been translated by Kushwan Singh. And it tells the story of what happened in um, um, Awadh. You know, the Nawab of uh, Awadh, the, uh, Nawab Wajid Ali Shah was on throne and what happened there um, do, uh, because of the revolution and so on. And she described, she was a courtesan who was very successful during the Nawabi period and she describes what used to happen in the days and she tells a story. There was a person called Chote Nawab and he fell in love with a courtesan, a young courtesan. And 
he came and started pestering her. But in those days, you know, the courtesans were stronger than the Nawabs. So she threw him out and she said, I don't want you. You go away. So he was heartbroken. So Chote, what did Chote Nawab do? He went and jumped into the river to commit suicide. But he was wearing a robe, you see. So he floated down the river. He didn't drown. And as he floated down the river, uh, Nawab Wajid Ali Shah was going down in his barge, as, like every evening he was going down. And he saw this spectacle of someone floating down the river, and he fished him out. And he asked him what he was doing, and the young man said, you know, I'm heartbroken and I want to commit suicide because I have been rejected by the young woman and so on. So Nawab Wajid Ali Shah was very, very moved. And he said to him, why do you do that? I'll make you an officer of the state, because you are come from a Nawabi family. And he made him an officer of the state. You know, and he became very successful. Having told the story, Umrah Janada adds a very significant comment. She says, such beautiful things used to happen in the days of yore. Now that the British have come, nothing matters except merit. <laughs> You see, to her, this whole notion that an officer had to be, had to be merited to be an officer was just unbelievable. I mean, the whole book is full of such beautiful instances. I'm only giving um, one example. So you see, a new, entire new set of values came up, and an entire new set of institutions came up. And one of the institutions that fascinated the um, Indians of the 19th century, particularly in Bombay and Calcutta, to lesser extent in Madras, was the theater, because it was a public space. You know, till the 19th century, the theater was considered a lower class, lower caste enterprise. Actors were looked down upon. They were, you know, they were not admitted into homes, they were not allowed to stay in uh, rich uh, uh, areas, and so on. And, um, but the British, on the other hand, adored their theater. I mean, they had uh, plays being done, Goldsmith and others, you know, she stoops to conquer or whatever it is. In their clubs, the Maim Sabs used to act in it. The Indians were excluded from it. And, you know, there was this whole glamour um, attached to theater. And then they built these theaters uh, in um, Calcutta and in, um, um, in Bombay. And this, this was a completely new phenomenon in Indian uh, cultural life. And these theaters brought in two concepts which were to change Indian um, notion of entertainment completely. The first one, they brought in the proscenium stage. Now, I won't hold forth on proscenium stage. You know what it is. Proscenium stage was the framework behind which a play took place. You know, there was the curtain. And behind the curtain, the scenes were held. Electric current uh, connections were very often, in those days, gas lights, but later electricity. But it was spectacle. So drama became spectacle and got separated from the audience, which sat out in the auditor audience, away from it on chairs, and so on, so on. And in, 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 in an Indian play, there was no such distinction, really, because the stage was open and the villagers used to sit around and so on. This has been talked about. But there was an even more important change which came because of the British, and that was the innovation of ticketing you know, of selling tickets. The whole idea that you had to pay to see entertainment was a British idea. You know, before the British came, before the ticketing came, if you wanted to, you, you, you know how the plays were held. Usually, um, a prince or a minister or someone, he wanted um, to have a child, a son, uh, or a job, or whatever it is, and he went to the temple and he prayed and he said, if I get this job, I'll organize this particular show. And the show was held, and the audience was invited, and 2,000 people were allowed free of charge. People came and sat there. And the entire aesthetic, uh, uh, entire financial burden was borne by the minister or the king or whoever it is. The audience didn't have to buy tickets. The audience didn't have to share in the risk. But when you buy a ticket, what happens is that you then demand you see, if you are not bought a ticket, then you are willing to take the risk. You are willing to take the aesthetic risk that something may go wrong. It doesn't matter. What does it mean? You have not put any money in it. Some artist may you know, fall down or forget his line. It doesn't matter. And the whole Indian notion of improvisation in theater that you see in um, music, you know, it was still, it's still there in classical music, but it was there also in dance once upon a time. 
that an artist can improvise depend, depends on the fact that the audience is willing to take an aesthetic risk. You know, if something goes wrong, they are willing you know, to let it go. And this even today continues. I have seen Bhim Sen Joshi come completely drunk on stage. You know, at a party, I mean, you know, at a whole aud auditorium of 2,000 people, Bhim Sen Joshi was carried in like that, you know, to, and he sat there, he leaned forward and fell asleep. And the audience waited for 10 minutes, and then the organization said, sorry, sorry, sent everyone home, and said, come tomorrow. Next day, Bhim Sen Joshi came, and he said, I'm very sorry, and he sang beautifully. And the audience only talked about how beautifully he had sung. You know, no one talked about the drunken night and the wasted night or anything, because that's what artists are, you know, the artists are allowed this freedom to do uh, mad things, but that tradition comes in India from the days when the audience was free to take that risk. But once you buy a ticket, once you paid your 25 rupees or 20 rupees, then you start demanding. Then you start demanding that, you know, I was told that for 25 rupees there will be five songs and six dances and ten spectacles, but today I, I got only four songs. You know, what happened to the five songs that you advertise, you know? Um, so it becomes commodified. Art becomes commodified. The whole question of improvisation, of risk, goes out of it. What was an aesthetic risk then becomes a financial risk. And then another thing happens, which is that the possibility that each show is different disappears. You know, if you go today and you like the show and you come tomorrow, you will say, no, but yesterday's show had six songs. No, why have you reduced it to four? Or my friend said that it had six songs or six dancers. I have paid as much money. Why, why am I being diddled and so on? So art becomes commodified. It becomes like a soap. You pay so much money, you get so much art in return for it. And this was perfect for the 19th century economy which the British introduced, which I said was an economy of marketplace, free trade. You know, what they did ultimately, because of ticketing, was to redu uh, re well, reduce or change, reduce, one need not be morally superior about it. What happened was that theater became a product of the marketplace. You know, it became business. You go went into theater, and this was a British experience. As you know, P um, after the Civil War in England, uh, English theater was not allowed to do either religious or political plays. They were forbidden. So they had to do entertainment, and people like Shakespeare, for instance, made a lot of money. They became landowners, their houses, um, you know, uh, and left lots of property for their wives and so on, which was unthinkable in India because they could, they, they became capitalists. And this idea that you can do business, theater as business comes into India with the, the British. And in 19th century, Patiari, just talking of uh, Bombay, you see this phenomenon that the financing of plays starts, comes from a community called the Parsis, who were known for their um, trade. You know, they were, they were in everything, including smuggling of uh, uh, opium to China. I mean, wherever money could be made, the Parsis were there. And uh, they were also in theater. And the whole audience was uh, Hindu, and they liked Hindu myths. But the most popular subject was Hindi or Urdu, and the Muslims were very good at it. So you got a theater which was financed by the Parsis, enjoyed by the Hindus, but written by the Muslims. Um, you know, a real secular theater. Because any question of religious or moral uh, um, consideration go out of it. What remains is the whole question of entertainment. You know, you have to entertain the audience. You have to see that the audience came tomorrow, bought the tickets, and that's how <coughs> um, uh, theater goes on. There was another thing that the 19th century theater, I'll talk of other arts, but art, theater is interesting uh, for various reasons. And uh, one of the things is that the British brought with them, they argued that um, their, uh, their entire culture was represented by Shakespeare. Now this was a big challenge to the Indians, you know, if the British had said that their uh, culture was represented by a philosopher, we had our philosophers, we had Ramanuja, we had Shankara, we had if they had said, we are represented by a poet, by Milton or something, we had our Valmiki, Vyasa and so on. But the British said by a playwright, but playwrights were considered very low in India at that time, you see. So immediately a search began for a playwright who would represent India, who would become the cultural icon, and it was found in 
a Sanskrit playwright, Kalidasa, you know, who was called the uh, Shakespeare of India by uh, William Jones, you know, Dr. William Jones and so on. And suddenly everywhere you see Kal Kalidasa, you know. But the interesting thing is, for the previous 2,000 years, there's not a single translation of Kalidasa in any Indian language. But in the 19th century, between 1860 and 1880, Marathi has four translations and Kannada has three. So somehow, immediately everyone needs a play. Every, every language seems to need a playwright, and the need comes from the British. You know, the British tell you um, uh, this. And the influence of Shakespeare, how, of course, Shakespeare was influential in many ways. I won't go into that. For instance, it's with Shakespeare, and not really with Freud. It's with Shakespeare that the Indian audiences discovered psychology. You know, of what, what psychologizing of the character, because in Sanskrit characters, in Sanskrit plays, there was no psychology. There was this, uh, you know, there were the four ca kinds of uh, heroes and so on, but I won't go into that, or we can go into that later. But Shakespeare was a tremendous uh, model, and uh, how huge an influence he was in Maharashtra can be, I'll give him, uh, is beautiful. Uh, summed up by the example of 1880s. You see, the Marathi, new Marathi film industry, uh, Marathi theater started in 1880s. 1880, Shakuntal was produced in Marathi by Kirloska. And, of course, the first play had to be a Kalidasa play, you see. So, it was Shakuntal. But while he was doing Kal uh, Kalidasa play, Kirloska writes in his diary, I want to create rasa in the English fashion. You know, so he wants, he has, a, he's being pulled to Rasa on one side, uh, Natya Shastra, but he wants to do it in the English fashion, you know. This is, uh, it's, it's a typical example of how, how tempting the English model was. Another beautiful example is Khadilkar. He was a playwright, he wrote a play called um, um, Kichakwad, and uh, it's told the story of Kichaka, you know, the villain in Mahar Mahabharata. Uh, he tried, he tries to rape um, Draupadi, and he wrote the play in 1906, and the, immediately it was seen as a political allegory by the British. Now, Draupadi ob obviously was Mother India, who else could she be? So who was trying to rape her? The British decided it was Lord Curzon. <laughs> they did. And so the play was banned, you know, because, because they thought it was. But what is interesting after this is that the next play that Khadilkar writes, is called Savai Madhav Rao and Samrutyu, the death of Savai Madhav Rao, uh, Peshwa and so on, and so on. And there the hero is modeled on Hamlet and the villain is modeled on Iago. You know, when the hero comes from Hamlet and the villain comes from Othello. So this shows the point I was trying to make. To them, the Shakespearean characters were not characters, they were real people. You could just borrow them and prompt them in your um, own play. Uh, this, this is an example. And the influence of Shakespeare is beautifully brought out by another um, playwright called Gadakari, Ram Ganesh Gadakari. And um, he, a brilliant man who died young, unfortunately. And Gadakari always said that I want to write 18 plays because I know I'm only half as good as Shakespeare. And he wrote 36 plays. <laughs> now, apart from the valorization of Shakespeare, what you find here is that Kirloskar was a Brahmin, Gadkari was a CKP, um, you know, Khadilkar was a Brahmin. So, in 1850s, no Brahmin would have been seen near a theater. He would not have been allowed to come to watch a theater. By 1880s, when it becomes a profession, it becomes acceptable within the caste system, you know? And so the entire, the caste, uh, the whole caste system changes our valuation of our business world. If something is vocation, it's not, you know, then it's something that you inherit. I mean, you know, are you a Brahmin? If you're a Brahmin, you can't do theater. Are you a, uh, you know, singer? You can't do it and so on and so on. But if it's a uh, business, then it's okay. Then you can do it, you know. So a lot, a lot of, uh, traditional forms which were lower caste forms, I'm sorry to use the word lower caste, but for convenience I'm using it. lower caste, then becomes turned into business and are adopted by higher caste. You know? And in the process, theater is a supreme example of that, in the process what happens is that those who were associated, the lower caste, the poorer caste that had kept that art form going through the centuries are turfed out. That's considered folk, folk theater, that's considered crude, that's not considered, you know, I mean, 
uh, Shakuntal actually started a dramatic form where the, everyone talked in Brahminical Marathi and all the women dressed like Brahmin women. So, you know, it was, it was completely a valorization of the Brahmin way of life. And this kind of social transformation starts taking place within society. And those classes which had kept these art forms going over the centuries are turned out. Now, I'll just take two brief examples that of how a similar thing was happening in other art forms for different reasons. Take, for instance, the visual arts. Now, in theater, as I said, uh, the, the British never interfered. They did their own theater. It was the Indians who saw it, fascinated, and they wrote their plays and built their own theater. But when it came to visual arts, um, if I talk too much, you, must, you know, if my cough refuses to interrupt, then you must, you must play my cough. Um, uh, what happened with the visual arts was um, the British had decided that Indians didn't know how to paint. You know, of course, they, they had a beautiful sense of design. You could see that. They had a beautiful sense of line. But it was very clear that they had no science. They didn't know how to do the human being. The human beings were dreadful, they, ought, they say. And therefore, it was essential to teach painting and architecture and sculpture to Indians. And they started uh, the, uh, 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 three uh, school, uh, colleges of arts, one in uh, Calcutta, then in Bombay, and in Madras, and then also in Lahore. And the whole purpose of this um, college of arts was to take these traditional artisans in India, you know, who had been traditionally uh, uh, doing theater or arms, and to teach them values of um, Western painting and Western thing, but to sustain them as uh, artisans. And the whole idea, again, came from England. In England, you see, by 19th century, because of the Industrial Revolution, all the industrial art forms, the, old, the, the traditional art forms were dry, dying out. The artisans were dying out. The new industrial designs were coming in, products were coming in. And there was an attempt to keep the industrial design going. In South Kensington, there was a, a department of uh, science and art, I think, science and culture or something, of that kind, which was trying to build up uh, principles of how to teach the working class to keep their traditional forms, while in Piccadilly, in Royal Academy, they were teaching fine arts. You know, you got uh, um, <clears throat> great painters there who sat there and painted very majestic paintings. And the British decided that what was happening in South Kensington was right for Indians, you know, because it was for the working class. And they introduced it to uh, Indian, uh, uh, in Indian colleges here for the working class here. But what happened was they built all their colleges in the cities, in Bombay, Madras, and Calcutta. The artisans all lived in the villages, OK? And then they expected them to pay fees. You know, the, the, the British mind works only in terms of fees and tickets and so on and so on. So, on. so the artisans couldn't pay. They thought it ridiculous to pay fee to learn their own craft, you know, to go all that. Then they had to buy equipment, which was modern equipment, brushes, paint brushes, and so on, and so on, and so on. And as a result of which, although these were supposed to be meant for artisans of India, traditional artisans, they remained out. Who came into these colleges? I mentioned earlier that in these, uh, in these uh, three cities, Indians had gathered. You know, the Indian middle class had come, tradespeople had come, and a, a whole Indian bourgeoisie had grown up admiring the British. And this, this bourgeoisie rushed into the art forms. Who were the painters? Who were the students? There were people like Abhanendranath Tagore, Gaganendranath Tagore. You know, they're all middle class people who come into the um, art form and they learn, and they learn how to do painting in, in, in the Western fashion. But something happens, which is that these people are very intelligent people. They are, you know, educated people. They're not just foolish people. They're, they learn the Western craft, but they decide that they have to have a separate identity. They have to have an Indian identity. And here they were learned, uh, led by three um, Western uh, scholars. One was Havel, who was the principal of, uh, um, of the Arts College, Sister Nivedita and Anand Kumar Swami. All of them said, we must have an Indian identity in painting. So, right, the uh, Tagores and the uh, the, the, you know, all the Bengali uh, intellectuals get together and they start to have an Indian identity in painting. But how, where do you get the Indian identity? The Indian identity was just sitting outside there. You know, all the craftsmen were sitting there. But the, for these people, they were lower caste. How could they go to them? So they didn't go to them. What they did is 
they created a new tradition, Ajanta. You know, you go to Ajanta. You go to Japanese painting. You go to create an Asian painting. So Indian painting is shadowless. You get all these figures floating around. You know, if you've seen Shantini Kitchen's uh, School of Painting, the, all the characters are sexless. I mean, you can see immediately that they would never procreate. So, you know, because they're all floating around. They, have no, no, they never step on the ground at all. And so you get this entire Shantini Ketan school, which is completely unrelated to what's happening in India at that, at that time. And it was only in 1930s that someone like, uh, 30 years later, that someone like Jamini Roy looks at the craftsman around and says, God, here is something that uh, we can pick up, we can uh, look. But the net result was that in our society, another set of concepts emerged, which wasn't there before. What is the difference between the Tagores and the people who are craftsmen in the city? The point is, the Tagores are artists, and the others are artisans. You see, immediately, this, this of course comes from England itself, as I said, it's a 19th century concept brought here, but applied to our society. Now, what is the difference between the artists and the artisans? The artists are inspired. They express their inner vision. You know, they, they are inspired by their genius. What does the artisan do? He carries on with the traditional craft he has learned from his grandfather, great-grandfather, and, and so on. And you know, there's not much creativity involved in it, and so on. So this is an example. The net result of this was that Indian painting completely lost all moorings. By 1930s, there was nowhere to go. I mean, you know, um, you know, someone like Yamine Roy survived that, but um, uh, Indian. Uh, uh, but what it did was the traditional artisans who were there were left out. They were left out of the city. They were left out of consideration. When the modern review, which was um, published by the Tagore family in the um, in Bengal, was published, they never published anything by the artisans. In fact, Venkatapaya, the Kannada in whose name we have a gallery here. He was a traditional artisan. He was a very good painter. He went to Calcutta. He stayed with them. The Tagores patronized him, let him stay at Jurasenko, which was their house, and all that. But they never published his work. Because he was déclassé. He was definitely, you know, he was not, didn't quite belong uh, to, to the class. Now, this is an example, a third example, which I shall quickly finish, of course, and you probably are quite familiar with it is the question of dances, dancing. Um, you, know, uh, the, you know that it was the Devadasis who used to carry on dancing in India. And when the Vijayanagar Empire fell, all the Devadasis fled from there to Tanjore. Tanjore was where. And in, 19, in 1850s, 18, there were as many as 25,000 um, Devadasis in Tanjore. And it was a very rich place where both Bharatanatyam and Karnataka music grew and you know people like Tyagaraja and so on were there and built and so on. But what happened is that in 1852, I think, yes, the British took away, they said the king had no children, so they took away the throne and all these 25,000 um, Devadasis became completely rootless. And slowly the only way they could sustain it was by prostitution. So by the, by the end of the uh, century, they were becoming, uh, the dancing was become identified with prostitution in India. And um, then, in, a, in the early years of the 19th century, there was a movement led by a Devadasi, ex-Devadasi, Muttalakshmi Reddy, who said we must ban dance, because it's indicative of how, you know, how decrepit or how destitute Indian culture has become. And at that time, interestingly, this is uh, interesting, the real interest in Indian dance came, you know, because of whom? There was an in American dancer called Ruth Sandeni, you know, and she was, uh, and she and her husband Ted Sean, they used to dance in New York. One day Ruth Sandeni was going and she saw a poster um, of an Egyptian cigarette, selling Egyptian cigarette, which showed an Egyptian goddess called Isis. And she was inspired and she said, that's it, that's what I should do. Then she went to an exhibition of an Indian village, um, you know, which showed Indian village as snake charmers and dancers and so on. And she was so inspired that Ruth Sandini started what's called the Oriental Dance. And she did, she'd never been to India, of course. She had no idea what India was like. She, she imagined herself 
she um, did uh, dances like Notch Girl, Radha, and so on. And, um, uh, and she had sometimes um, the uh, great Sufi uh, singers uh, accompanying her, her. But she was, well, she was herself. She was a genius and herself. And ultimately, one of her great disciples was Martha Graham, who gave birth to the modern dance. I mean, but Ruth Sandin is very significant in the history of Indian dance because she was the first one who made the word oriental dance fashionable. You know, then there was Madame Pavlova in uh, Russia who took uh, Uday Shankar and uh, taught him. But there was so much ignorance about Indian dance in India that Tagore, after he started Shantiniketan, invited uh, Ruth Santhani to um, Shantiniketan. And he said, you must do something to say, save Indian dance. You know, I mean, because Tagore and others had, ultimately Tagore got Manipuri dance to Shantiniketan, you know, the awareness came. But it shows how ignorant Indians were about India and what, what about our culture. And there was a whole dance form dying away in Madras at that time. As I said, you know, there was a movement uh, to uh, ban and so on. So in 1927, when the first Indian uh, National Congress met in Madras, they formed something called the in, um, Madras Music Academy, which still survives and flourishes. And it had a genius of a secretary called E. Krishna Iyer, who was a dancer himself. And E. Krishna Iyer realized that if some, nothing was done, um, Indian dance would die away. And Muthulakshmi Reddy was getting, um, you know, get, get, be getting people to ban it and so on. So what he did is he invited two sisters, Kalyani sisters, um, the young Kalyani daughters, I think they were called, to dance on the stage of Madra, uh, Madras Music Academy. It, uh, an event that was not, not noticed by anyone at all as of significance, but a tremendously significant event because for the first time, dance came out of the temple onto the stage. You know, it, it came to where the tickets were sold. It came to where there was a larger audience and got a, got a larger audience. And then the Madras Music Academy passed a resolution. <clears throat> this is an interesting resolution. They decided we must save the dance, and you know it was then called uh, Dasi Artam, the dance of Dasi, or the, the Sadar Nach. Sadar was a Persian word meaning presentation. Sadar Karna, they say, so Sadar Nach and so on. So they passed a resolution giving the dance a new name, and the new name was Bharatanatyam. So if we, everyone talks of Bharatanatyam being 2,000 years old, but it isn't. The word was adopted by a resolution in 1933 by the Madras Music Academy, thanks to, and immediately it became acceptable to the Brahmin Society of Madras, because now it was Bharatanatyam, you know, you could connect it with Bharata or what, whatever you want, so on, so on. So, and Rukmini Devi Arundel, uh, who was a genius in her own right, I mean, it's, the way I speak, it may sound as the one is sneering at them, I'm not, it was a very complex situation, but it's a very interesting situation. Rukmini Devi Arundel form, started the uh, Kalakshetra, but she could, and in the Kalakshetra, she never took any devdas, not a single devdas. She, she took only Brahmin teachers and, uh, you know, Brahmin teachers. But she could do it because she was married to a foreigner. You know, her husband was an Australian, Arundel, uh, who was a part of the, um, you know, the people that collected. And um, uh, the Theos Theosophical Society. And on the strength of his backing, she started um, the Kalakshetra. And the Kalakshetra then... Uh, excluded all the Udasis and turned it into a Brahminical form. Now, if you look at the history of 1950s, uh, 1930s, when I was there in Madras, there were three women who were very fascinating. Um, and one was uh, Rukuni Devi Arundel, of course. Then there was Subhlakshmi, the great singer. And there was Bala Saraswati. Now, Bala Saraswati was a Devdasi dancer who had never given up Devdasis. She was fiercely Devdasi, and she dressed like a Devdasi, she didn't accept it. Subhulakshmi was the opposite. She was a Devdasi, but she gave up everything and became a completely Brahmin woman. You know, Sadashivan and her husband gave him her. She dressed like, it is said that not only did the Brahmin women imitate her in dressing, but even how she pronounced uh, Tamil, you know, they, you have to listen to her. She became the perfect Brahmin woman, followed her husband around. And so on one side, you have the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, Brahmin uh, culture. On another side, you have uh, um, uh, Subhulakshmi, uh, 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 Bala, 
and the third one was of course uh, Rukmini Devi Arundel who takes a non-Brahmin form and with the help of a non-Brahmin turns it into a Brahmin form, you know, and uh, sticks all Brahmins out. And um, in 1950s, there was a great um, Sangeet Natak Academy um, um, meeting, a very big meeting. Uh, India had just become independent. They were all invited. And the story, I was told this by Nara and Menon, my uh, uh, chairman before me in the Sangeet Natak Academy. Apparently, when they were met, uh, Rukmini Devi Arundel stood up and gave a long lecture on how dirty the dance form had become, how she had to clean it up, and how to purify it, and you know, how, how the dance form had to be saved by them. And after she spoke, Bala got up. Bala had a foul tongue. And you know, she came from the uh, this, um And she got up and said, what Rukmini Devi has said is very true. These upper class women have taken up our profession, profession and they have only left us our art. <laughs> this is a recorded conversation. So, well, on that point, I'll quickly come to the summing up. You know, if you look at our culture of the last hundred years, um, how would you look at them? What, what has happened to it because of this colonial confrontation? Now, let me say first, um, you can divide the, our arts into three different categories. First, there is those, there is a category which came out stronger because of colonialism. Then there is a category where colonialism virtually killed the arts. And third, there is a whole category which, where colonialism brought new forms. So I shall take them one by one. The first one is the art forms which came out stronger. One was dance. One was music. You see what happened is because of colonial education, caste barriers broke. Otherwise, only Devdasi women could dance. Only particular uh, categories could dance. This broke. And therefore, more and more people came, and dance and music um, flourished. In fact, I think it's right to say that today, Indian dance is, uh, is more rich and uh, is, uh, has reached higher peaks than ever before in its history, in 2,000 years or 3,000, however long you count your history. But it is because today there's information. There are no barriers. And you know, really very bright people are coming and experimenting and so on. So this is the first category. The second category was the art form which was destroyed by colonialism. I have already mentioned painting, how painting really became, you know, till 1950s. It, Indian painting comes into its own now, you know, in the 60s and 70s, with people like Hussein, with people like Gaitonde, uh, you know, uh, so late. Otherwise, it's absolutely barren, the earlier part. Another um, category that was completely destroyed, completely destroyed, almost uh, methodically by the British education was architecture. You see, because the, these schools only taught British uh, architecture. And in these cities, in, in not in this century, but in the last century, 20th century, two major cities were built in India. New Delhi was built when the British decided to move their capital from Calcutta to New Delhi. From 1913 to 1931, for nearly 20 years, New Delhi was built, and Lachians uh, built it with the help of a, a person called Herbert Baker. And neither of them had any sympathy for uh, Indian architecture. So when they used Indian architects who were there in large numbers, they used them only for menial work, you know, to do little tiles or this or that. But there were any creative decisions were taken by them and the Finnish, uh, you know, and you have an example now, if you go to New Delhi, you can see the kind of colonial, imperial, neo-imperial architecture that produced. Interesting, historical product, but the fact is that it, it killed off Indian architecture. Then, after India became independent, it was decided to build, build Chandigarh. And what does Mr. Nehru do? He invites um, uh, hmm? La Corbusier, Corbusier, Frenchman, and he tells Corbusier, don't do anything that tradition would accept. Some do something new. And Le Corbusier does just that. He does produce stuff that no one can live in, no one can operate. It has no concept of anything connection with Indian city. There it is. It's sitting, if you go there, you can see how people are adjusting to live in that city. Um, you know, because it's completely built without any concept of where people live, where they go to the market, how do the women go, how, where the children will go, you know, nothing. Because Corbusier was a neo-modernist. He sat there and they did it. Uh, Corbusier's great contribution probably is the disciples he left. 
you know, he was there, Leo, uh, uh, the several uh, uh, architects came, um, he was there, uh, Khan was there, and they built disciples like Charles Correa, for instance, you know, and, and many others who then went on to try and build up a new uh, Indian architecture, but the traditional Indian architecture was more or less destroyed. And you know what has brought it back? Uh, the, what has brought Indian architects back into some kind of existence is the destruction of the Babri Masjid. Because of the destruction of the Babri Masjid, suddenly funding came to Hindu temples. You know, every Hindus all over the world suddenly woke up to the religion, as you know, and um, money poured into, and you had temples like Akshardham, uh, you know, or Swaminarayan temple and so on, which used traditional Indian architects that you must grant them. So that a whole body of architects who would have died out revived. Unfortunately, the aesthetics of these temples is very backward looking, you know, because they still try to create temples which look like 13th century or 14th century rather than the 21st century. But they did revive the architects and uh, architecture and uh, so on. The third category which I have mentioned, which is that um, art forms which came from abroad are, of course, photography. The first one is photography. Photography didn't suffer from paint. Uh, painting didn't suffer by the coming of photography in India because the two of them came together. Then there are books, printing, which came, which was first resisted because they thought the missionaries were trying to convert the whole of the country. Um, then recording, which is a very important because uh, development in 1903, Goharjan singing her first uh, plate. And what recording did was to take music out of all the palaces and the rich people and so on and bring it into the middle class. True, it's only three and a half minutes, but there it is. Indian music, you can hear someone. And recording went and it transformed the whole nature. It meant that uh, Indian artists didn't have to depend on royalty anymore or go to small places. They could live in the cities, make money and so on. And of course, in the 1930s comes films. As you know, um, <clears throat> uh, when 1930s, the uh, uh, sound came to uh, cinema, in the West, cinema began to speak, but in India, it began to sing and dance. And it's what saved us today is, in fact, music. I, I mentioned earlier that music today is more glorious than ever before, but every art form that you see around you that flourishes today is because of Indian music, and one of them certainly is Indian films. Uh, people laugh at the songs in Indian music, and I was always, when I was told when I was young, you know, what is this song and dance, you know, running around the trees and so on, you must do something, and we really believed it. We actually made films without songs in those days, uh, you know, with the Satyatara and so on. And when I was in college, you know, there was uh, French cinema with Godard and Truffaut, there was Japanese cinema with Ozu and Kurosawa, there was Italian cinema with Fellini, uh, Antonio and so on, we had only one Satyatra and we used to say, how is it look, they have glorious cinema. Now, 50 years later, you see what happens. There's no French cinema, no Japanese cinema, no Italian cinema. All three have been swallowed up by Hollywood. The only industry that has not been swallowed up by Hollywood is Bollywood. <laughs> and that's because they don't know how to handle our songs. <laughs> Literally is true. That's literally true. They could, I mean, you can't make a tit uh, uh, Titanic, but you, uh, they can't make Hama Aapke Haan Kaun either. <laughs> and despite attempts by Bollywood to uh, uh, come into, Hollywood to come into Bollywood, because you know, uh, Hindi films sell five times as many tickets as, the American, uh, as American films do. They earn less because the ticket rates are lower. But the market for Hindi films is just enormous. And you know, the American filmmakers would give their you know, right hand to uh, get into it. And they don't, but they have got into it. So that brings me to the most recent art form, art form, technology, I don't know how to do it, which is electronics, of course. Um, and, um, and the whole question of where we are going to go from here. Uh, you know, first, uh, the fear, uh, the initial fear when um, uh, Computers came and so on when uh, lap laptops came and computer technology came. Even today, the fear is not unreal. The fear is that everyone started sending their children to English medium schools. Today, even your driver wants more money to send his child to the English medium school because he'll get a job rather than to Canada or wherever it is. This is a problem. 
Fair enough. I mean, why not? He has the right to look after children. But there's another angle to it. While this may suggest that our Indian languages may die out, you know, in 1991, when the skies opened out and we had our cable television and uh, satellite television and so on, you know, everyone said, now there will be a murdochization of India. You know, the foreign uh, companies will come in and they will take over our skies and we'll have nothing but foreign companies. Nothing like that happened. All the new channels that came up were all in regional languages. Because what happens, you know, in Canada today, has something like 25 channels and Tamil and Telugu and so on. And the skies are full of Indian languages being spoken. And the reason for this is that while you may need your child to have English, to have a job, when it comes to laughing and crying, you can only do it in your mother tongue. <laughs> you know, and you enjoy doing it. You can't, I mean, you can only laugh or cry only this much in English, you know, but ultimately <laughs> <laughs> you, you come back. And so we are in a linguistically very strange situation where on one side it looks as though uh, as a language of usage and administration, English, uh, Indian language may be dying. On the other day, on the other hand, as performing uh, media, they are just flourishing. Now the question is whether the two can be brought together, and to what extent the new electronic technology will um, uh, help do this. You see, one of the first things I mentioned earlier was one of the things that the British created was this dichotomy between the city and the village. You have to come to the city for everything. If you wanted to go to the college, you have to come to the city. If you gone to the hospital, you have to go come to the city. You have to go to the government college, you have to come to the city. Everything. And the, the, you know, the, so that the villages became known as the hinterlands, the backwoods, you know, where the ignorant people lived and suffered. Now, this need not be so anymore because of electronics. It's possible to have this knowledge spread there, sp spread across for them. And you know, with television and so on, it's already happening. I mean, villages can, every village home can have a television, potentially at least, and can have a laptop. And therefore, a whole new culture may develop, a whole new, call it entertainment, culture, education, whatever it is, which I hope uh, will bridge this gap. I think on that note, I will call a halt. Thank you very much for listening to me for such like I must be. Yes, indeed. Yes, if anyone asks to ask my questions, my cough is ready. <laughs> <clears throat> yes. Answer, well, let me answer the first question to some extent. In many art forms, like theatre, women were not allowed to come on stage. Kathakali, the women are not allowed to come. And so, but on the other hand, many art forms like dance and so on were only carried on by women and women of the lower caste. By you know, through the centuries, it was the devdasis and so on who who carried on, and they were the uh, money earners. And it's very interesting if you study the, the history of Devadasis in 1880s. There are Indian sociologists who have done a very great deal of work. What happened is that the movement for banning of uh, Devadasism came not only from other castes, but for the men in the Devadasi community. Because Devadasi community men said, look at any other civilized community, the men dominate. You know, look at the British, the men dominate. Look at the Brahmins, the men dominate. But in a Devadasi community, it's the woman who's dominant. And they saw this as a mark of regression. And they, you know, there were debates on this point. So they, they said that Devadasism, because, um, you know, she was free to uh, earn her living, she was willing to dance, she, was, she could even have a master if she wanted. And this kind of freedom that was given to women was resent, not resented traditionally, but as they got exposed to modern art, they started resenting it. You know, and ultimately, it's, uh, uh, the whole debate on whether Devdasism should be banned depended on was it 
a vocation, was it a caste or was it a profession? If it was a caste, you know, it was traditional. You couldn't do anything, that's okay. But if it was a profession, then it was sinful. How could a woman earn money, you know, by dancing? And exactly that's what happened when, uh, in 1937, the, the first Congress government was elected in Madras. They banned Devadasism, but they didn't ban prostitution. You know, so, so uh, a woman being dominant in the society was not acceptable at all. Thank you. Vis-a-vis -vis what? Well, the more confidence in Indian arts today, as I said, an American dancer could be brought by Tagore in 1906 to tell us what to do with Indian dance, uh, you know, how to save Indian dance. Now, that kind of thing is unlikely to happen. Uh, Indian uh, arts are much more confident. Uh, a great deal of the credit goes to Ravi Shankar, because Ravi Shankar was the first artist who took sitar, went abroad, <coughs> worked with the <coughs> artists there, worked with the Beatles, worked with Philip Glass, worked with, you know, uh, with the Japanese artists, and he sat with them and taught them, and, you know, and he never played uh, a Western note in his life. He just played. He said, I'll only play Indian music, but I'll play with you. And Ravi Shankar has this great... And then, of course, the fact that at the same time there was this whole Indian diaspora that went out to, you know, who then uh, people like uh, Ali Akbar Khan, people like... Uh, uh, you know, there are lots of now, uh, Zakir Hussain and so on, they all have a worldwide market because of, um, uh, because of the Indian diaspora that goes abroad. One nice thing about Indian diaspora abroad is that they don't buy a Picasso, they will buy a Hussain. The, you know, the, the, there is a certain, um, they may have a, a Picasso or some other painting to show that they know what world is, but most of the sales are of Indian they, the Indian music, of course, is what they, uh, appeals to them. Western music, very few people respond. And uh, uh, now uh, a lot of Indian musicians go abroad to uh, perform and make a living and so on. So I think, so as far as uh, Paris and so on is concerned, there's hardly any <coughs> lack of confidence. Even Indian dancers who grow up, Akram Khan, for instance, who is a great, um, he's a Bangladeshi, incidentally, Akram Khan, who is a great uh, is a Kathak dancer in London, he's adored. I mean, he's like a um, you know new ballet dancer. He's just a, a great figure. So um, yes, that's the first question. Second question is what makes a good uh, writer? That uh, if you survive, you are a good di a writer. That's all you can say. If, you know, if you don't survive, you're gone. That's it. You, you know that fast enough. Any questions? None? Oh. Yeah. It's, it's very sad. It's tragic what's happened to Indian education. Because, you know, the whole of India used to grow up being bilingual, trilingual in my time. No one ever thought of... Uh, you know, if you're on the border of Maratha, Maharashtra and Canada, you spoke Marathi in Canada easily. Uh, the whole question of one medium in school, you know, comes from Europe. You know, in Germany, German, uh, Germany is the one medium. In France, it's French which is one medium. But why should we have a single medium uh, school? I mean, why can't we have two languages, three languages? Scandinavians teach very good English. You know, they teach their own languages, but if you talk to a 22-year-old Scandinavian uh, student, speak perfect English because they're taught good English. It's possible to teach. We were taught. We learned Kannada. I learned, uh, started learning English at the age of 10 or whatever it is. But so what? One learned and one developed. It's possible to teach. So this whole language problem is really uh, was un unfortunate. We are losing a gift we had uh, for uh, by adopting, as I said, these nonsensical notions like 
a medium of instruction, one language medium of instruction, and so on. I don't see why we couldn't have, we, why shouldn't to, uh, teach our children two or three languages. They can be one medium of instruction, Canada, English, whatever it is, but Hindi they can learn. I mean, they automatically they learn from Hindi films anyway. You know, the Hindi films have done that much for us, I and mean, you can learn Canada. Well, it's one of the history of theatre. You see that there are all kinds of waves which come up and go, come up and go. Uh, absurd theatre was one of them. I mean, you can't write absurd theatre anymore without uh, echoing Beckett and UNESCO now after 50 years. Um, you know, in those days, existentialism and all those figures were there. Uh, no, I, mean, I think it's dead as a dodo, uh, that whole theatre. There are other ways of doing theatre have come up, um, you know, and um, there were other ways of doing theatre before also. You know, there was, uh, um, <clears throat> and I, I can't think of the various schools that came, particularly in Europe in the 20th century, experimental schools used to come up and go, come up and go. In India, we're discovering now. Uh, someone like Veena Pani Chawla, who's working in uh, Pondicherry, she uses Chow, she uses Kathak, and brilliant theatre. She knows her absurdist theatre, but I mean, she doesn't use it. <laughs> Very dubious looking question. Huh? Well, I'll tell you what, uh, I'll tell you my experience of Mohan Rakesh. The point is, as I said, Indian theatre, the modern Indian theatre comes because of British theatre and because of Shakespeare, we start writing plays. But for the first hundred years, from say middle of the 18th century till um, 1940s, most of the plays written in India are dreadful. Uh, absolutely second rate. Even Tagore, I mean, he's a great poet, but his plays are unbearable. Uh, and you know, real serious playwriting begins with uh, Nabonna in Calcutta. You know, uh, Ipta started it, the first uh, theater. And if you want to ask me which is the first great play of the 20th century that to come out, I would say Andhayuk. You know, Dharmavir Bharti. What happened in the 50s and the 60s after independence? There was an awareness that we, Mohan Rakesh started giggling and I started giggling and soon we were both giggling and nudging each other and giggling. Then the first act ended and then Mohan Rakesh turned to me and said, do you know why we are giggling? Because we know that the future of Indian theatre is in our hands. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think we'll listen. Yeah. For instance? said your dancers internalized what? What was it? Oppression. What oppression? There was no oppression at all among the Devdasis. That was the whole problem. The men wanted to oppress them. And they were, you know, the whole society, the Devdasis is very, very, very powerful and had a very powerful position in their own society. In fact, ultimately it banned because they were too powerful, you know, and because they were their own money earners and the whole idea that a, a woman could use her body to earn her living was unacceptable to British and to the Brahmin and you know there are other societies. So ultimately 
the, and you must remember that in these hundred years, I'm talking of Ruth Sandhani. Ruth Sandhani came to India in 1920. We are here in 2010. The development in Indian dance is just fantastic, like in music, you know. What was considered great dance in 1920s isn't considered great dance today because there's more information, more development. Have you, any of you, seen Kalpana of uh, Uday Shankar? Well, my advice is don't because then you will believe that Uday Shankar was a great dancer. Because if you see the dance, you suddenly realize that the man couldn't dance for nuts. You know, the Ravi Shankar's elder brother. Because he was not trained. You see, today dance has become such a sophisticated uh, form. He, had, he just went there and had worked out what he thought was the oriental dance form, his shoulders moved, he was beautiful. And that was taken for a, a Indian dance. But you know, now when you see um, these dances in Hindi films, they're just incredible. I mean, you know, the, the, the agility, the command of the body, the, uh, this is just, they may, not, they may be doing stupid dances, but they're not stupid dancers. Uh, you know, it, it, they may look like it, that's because of the demand of the age, but they are extraordinarily good dancers. So I would say, yes, dance has actually improved and become power, more powerful. Um, well, it's no use comparing it to Mohini Atam or so on. It was another era, you know, Bharatanatyam. Bharatanatyam used to be danced in temples, now it's danced in, uh, uh, on the stage, um, you know, and, and this kind of thing. Developments keep changing. Now there's television that's available, there are academies that are available. The whole cultural scene is very, very different. So I think, uh, no, I don't think that it's gone worse. I don't think we need to go to uh, Western modernity or anything. Things are happening very well here, I think. Uh, and we have some superb dances. Veena Pani Chawla, as I said, sitting there in Pondicherry and doing excellent work. Half the time she's, even uh, Nritigram here, what work is doing in dance, is really first rate. So, uh, and, and they are aware. So on one side you have, of course, the tradition, the Madras Music Academy, uh, or the Kalakshetra kind of dancing, where you are told, no, no, your hand can't go to me in chap, it has, can't go to dance. But that's also there, that's a discipline, you know, like in ballet. You do it, you've got, to, you've got to suffer that. But that's one end. To the other end, where there's experimenting, there's improvisation, there's going. It's, it's, the, it's for the artist to take the... Nice thing is that today's world offers the chance. On that note, I think I will thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much.